I am president of the United States of America, and the buck stops with me. President Biden stands by his decision to pull troops out of Afghanistan in this one of the most tragic humanitarian crises of our generation and unprecedented desperation as hundreds rush the tarmac at Kabul's International Airport, some clinging to the sides of this military aircraft. We're going to show it to you as it began to taxi. These are the images that we may not be able to get out of our minds. Afghan citizens hoping that U.S. Air Force jet would actually let them board to escape the Taliban who have now taken over the capital. Tonight, new information about the effort to get U.S. journalists out safely as well. The Donlin Report starts right now. We severely degraded al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation building. Our only vital national interest in Afghanistan remains today what it has always been, preventing a terrorist attack on America's homeland. I stand squarely behind my decision. President Biden says he has no regrets. This as the collapse of Afghanistan puts the war on terror and whether the U.S. is winning it in full focus. Good evening. I'm Adrian Banker. Joe Donlin is back tomorrow. The president is addressing what is now a new Afghanistan ruled by the Taliban, something he simply could not imagine just weeks ago. So the question now is, where do they go from here? That the jury is still out, but the likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. In just a couple of hours from now, the sun will rise on another day in Kabul. Those who remain in their homes in shock and fear, greeted by uncertainty and potential terror on the ground. Today, we woke up to this video of hundreds of people swarming the international airport to try desperately to get out of the country. Afghans running alongside a U.S. Air Force plane, some trying to cling on for dear life as it takes off. We won't show it to you now, but we do know that two people tied themselves to the plane's wheels falling to their death as the plane took off, risking their lives rather than remaining in the country with the Taliban in charge. Tonight, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is warning of terror attacks here in the U.S. now that the Taliban takeover is complete. Here, the Afghan president leaving the country, saying lives will be spared by his stepping down. The Taliban now taking over the presidential palace. And we're left to wonder what happened after 20 years, $1 trillion, and more than 2,400 service members' lives lost in Afghanistan. What was the result? A scene reminiscent of the end of another war. Back in 1975 in Vietnam, the fall of Kabul looked a lot like the fall of Saigon. We have every angle covered for you tonight, starting with Mark Fisher, senior editor at the Washington Post, Scott Mann, who served in Afghanistan and was an Army Green Beret, and our Leland Vittert, host of On Balance. Mark, we start with you first. There are a lot of reports of Afghans, those who have helped the U.S. military and villagers who feel this is a death sentence for all who remain in the country. Is this the Biden administration's Saigon? Well, certainly his opponents will make it out to be, uh, but uh, there are important differences between Saigon and this. Uh, first of all, this is a bipartisan decision to pull out. It may not sound like one in this moment as we enter into the classic Washington blame game, uh, but in fact, it was Donald Trump's policy uh, that he never executed, but it was his policy to withdraw all American troops from Afghanistan, and Joe Biden has now gone ahead and done that. This is a bipartisan effort uh, really through 20 years in Afghanistan. We saw both Republicans and Democrats pumping more and more troops into the country. And now both Democrats and Republicans saying it's time to pull out after many years of failure. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there will be a lot of politics over the coming days and weeks. But in the end, uh, Biden is doing what the great majority of Americans have been clamoring for for many years, which is getting out. You know, you hear a lot of the outcry, but I have to say, is there an argument that this is the best solution to pull out? 
Well, certainly uh, the president made that argument in his address uh, today, and it's an argument that has been made by both parties for many years. Uh, this has been a bipartisan disaster. Uh, indeed, there is tremendous damage, and we're seeing the, these emotional pictures of people panicking and fleeing for their lives. The administration says they're going to take in tens of thousands of refugees, uh, people who have helped Americans through the years, uh, and uh, that's ongoing, but it doesn't uh, come close to the numbers who obviously want to get out. The White House is being asked now to protect journalists from the New York Times, the Washington Post, others in Kabul, hundreds of people. Have you heard from journalists there? Are, are you aware that they're in imminent danger or, or what have you heard it was the latest on the ground? Well, there are, are a couple of hundred people who work, uh, most of them are Afghan nationals, who work for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. They're translators and drivers and cooks and uh, people who set up interviews and that sort of thing. And they have dedicated themselves to the American cause, just as uh, many other Afghans have to uh, help out our military. And so it's uh, the effort by uh, our newspaper and others to get those people who have been helpful to us uh, and uh, who, have been, who have risked their lives for us uh, to get them out to a safe place. And so these newspapers have now asked the State Department for help in doing that. Mark Fisher, senior editor for The Washington Post, thank you so much. Let's turn now to Scott Mann, now retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, Green Beret, and expert on the 20-year war. You were there, and we do have some images. We want you to take a look. The, the Taliban literally fights wars from the back of pickup trucks while Americans trained and equipped Afghan forces. How did the Taliban overtake these well-armed troops? Well, I think a lot of it is the fact that we have to remember that the Afghan army has only been alive for 20 years. I mean, you know, when, the, when, when Afghanistan fell in the 70s to the Soviets, you know, their professional army fell with it. And, you know, I was there as part of that training process, and we literally started with nothing. And, and so, you know, it takes, imagine the, the U.S. military after 20 years, right? And, and it takes time. Uh, it is a long-term process, and unfortunately, uh, we were nowhere near a uh, autonomous readiness for this force. Uh, they needed advisors by their side, and we didn't provide that. Military officials weeks ago said that the U.S. would only go back into Afghanistan if there was a domestic threat from the country here in the United States. So what do we say to those who think it's no longer America's responsibility to do what Afghan troops should have been doing? Look, Adrian, what I will tell you is that there are uh, international terror groups with global projection capability and intent that base out of strategic safe havens. And we've already seen historic precedent out of Afghanistan. And I think we'd be deluded to think that they're not going to try that again. Now you also have ISIS in the mix. And so now they're going to have an unfettered safe haven by which to operate. And one of the best antibodies to that is a local population that's unwilling to house and entertain those groups and not leaving a residual force there, a counterterrorism force and a force of advisors to work with our partner nation Afghan partners and, and, and local Afghans, I think is gonna be something that we're gonna, we're gonna pay for down the road and we're gonna find ourselves back in Afghanistan. I don't think our future with Afghanistan is, uh, is set. I think we will find ourselves there again, except this time it's gonna be our children fighting it instead of us. Do you agree that it's not worth losing more American troops over there in that mess? I mean, this is obviously a complicated, generations-long situation. Yeah, no, I, I do believe that it's worth the risk of U.S. blood and treasure. Um, please excuse the siren in the background here, but, you know, there's, there's always been a demand signal for us to uh, build capacity with partner nations. This is where international terror groups set up shop in these at-risk, uh, high-risk places. And if we don't go in there and establish some level of partnership with these countries, then someone else is going to. And that's just the way it goes. It doesn't need to be 100,000 troops, but we have specially trained advisors for that, and we need to look at that. But for now, I think the focus is we need to stop playing the blame game, come together as Americans, get our citizens out, and get those brave Afghans out who stood at our shoulder. And, and of course, there's the priority of disrupting the reestablishment of terror groups like al-Qaeda and other jihadist groups. I mean, how are we going to recover with so much lost in just days. It is, it's, you know, that's the, that's the tragedy. And I think that's what we have to step back and look is like we are literally elbowing our way back into a country 
to do a non-combatant evacuation where we were just in and we left of our own volition. I mean, that's where I think we really need to step back. And I would love to see, and I think a lot of Americans and certainly veterans would love to see a couple of national level politicians just own this thing and step up and, and, and actually stop blaming other administrations or whoever and just get serious about what we need to do there going forward. It, that's the part that is so disheartening to me right now is how we are literally assigning blame rather than coming together and recognizing that we, we have troops in harm's way right now that are doing a very, very tough mission and the rest of the world is watching us and we have a chance here to do the right thing. Uh, but right now, the way the leadership's showing up, I'm, I'm pretty disappointed and, and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of veterans that I'd like like to see us do better than that. Scott Mann, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel and Green Beret and Afghanistan war expert. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, also the founder of Hero's Journey, if you'd like to check that out online. We appreciate you joining us. Now to Leland Vittert, host of On Balance. Now, Leland, you've been to hot spots similar to Afghanistan. We've heard this term, you know, the end of this war. Doesn't yeah. that sound contradictory with the beginning of so much disruption? I think it's the end of the war for the United States, undoubtedly, and there's no elegant way to lose a war, which is what's happened here. We, we have ceded this war to the Taliban. Uh, we did that back in February of last year when we made a deal with them. And I don't think there was anybody who reasonably felt that the Afghan army uh, was going to stick around for the fight. Now, they probably stuck around for a lot shorter time than anybody thought they were going to be, and there was an intelligence failure there. But... There is no elegant way to lose a war and retreat is a messy and ugly and embarrassing thing. You can imagine the, the pictures we're watching right now of America in retreat and the Taliban taking over the presidential palace there in Kabul. Uh, if there had been a 24 hour news channel covering the British withdrawal from Dunkirk during World War II, that wouldn't have looked very pretty either. What about what it says to the world, to our global audience about our nation? Is this withdrawal going to cause other countries to see this as a failure? Well, it, objectively, it's a failure, right? So the, the U.S. is leaving, our enemy, the Taliban, is taking over. But the question is, what message does it send to our allies? What does it send to our enemies? We are weaker in the eyes of our enemies, and we are untrustworthy in the eyes of our allies. And you can argue all the time that America should not be the world's policeman, but we've seen over the past you know, 100 years that the world is a safer place when America is strong, America is trusted, and America is feared. So if you believe that, as history has shown us, then today the world is not as safe of a place. Did it seem like those who predicted that exactly what is happening now would happen, were they ignored? Or was this some type of just plan that stubbornly we need to get out? Well, again, there's no elegant way to do this. The Taliban was not going to allow us to have a parade from the U.S. Embassy out to the airport where we were going to lower the flag to taps and play the Star Spangled Banner and do all these things and then hop on our C-17 and get out. Uh, these are medieval terrorist thugs that we are fighting against. Though, who negotiated with the U.S.? Who, who did, and, and we, we negotiated and we made a deal with them, and frankly, they have so far have kept their end of the deal. There's a reason, and this is sort of what's going unsaid perhaps, for all of the horribleness and embarrassment of these pictures, there's not fighting in Kabul right now. There's 6,000 troops in harm's way, but they're not fighting their way into the airport. And as far as we hope, they're not gonna fight their way out because the Taliban realizes that if they fire a shot, that brings the US back into the war and they're more than happy to enjoy their time on television right now, let the US leave, let our allies and friends leave, and then they'll go about their medieval repression. Well, they certainly do like to do some interviews because that's what's happening right well, now. Well, for a while, we heard from the Taliban a lot more than we heard from the president over the weekend. Yeah, you've got a good point there. Leland Vitter on balance on tonight. Thank you so much. A reminder, the show airs right after our program on News Nation, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central Time. Stay tuned. The shocking images from Afghanistan, as we've been saying, a lot of people say it, the longest war, America's longest war coming to an end. Fears of a terrorist state rise from Kabul. And what about the citizens of the country? As some are allowed into the U.S., others face new uncertainties. Will the women and children of Afghanistan be safe? And don't forget to follow us on social media at The Donlin Report. Remember, Joe is back tomorrow, but stay tuned. We've got more on this story coming up.
With the Taliban taking over Afghanistan, thousands of Afghans are trying to flee the country. The U.S. has just announced plans to house up to 30,000 of, of those refugees in military bases here on U.S. soil. And joining me now with more News Nation's Joe Khalil. Joe, who are the people coming over who are seeking sanctuary here in the U.S.? And perhaps what did they do in Afghanistan? Are they prioritizing those who served U.S. military forces? So, Adrian, you hear a lot about translators, and there certainly are a lot of Afghan translators that work with uh, the U.S., but these are basically anybody in Afghanistan who risked their own lives working in some way with American forces on the ground there to fight against the Taliban. So I, I personally met uh, engineers from Afghanistan who were working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for example, uh, to put together infrastructure to try to help them uh, in terms of their weapons delivery to fight against the Taliban. Now, again, if the Taliban finds out who these people are during that time, or after, their lives are at risk, their families' lives are at risk. So that's why a lot of these people do this, help the United States to not only help their own country, but also many see it as their ticket to get to the U.S., to get that special immigrant visa and get resettled here. Those are the people we're talking about. That's why by, on a bipartisan level and in the Department of Defense, it's a priority to get those people uh, to the U.S. safely because there is sort of an obligation to help them as they've helped the United States. And how long are they planning to be at the bases? What happens to them once they arrive? So we know that they come to bases like this, like Fort Lee here in Virginia. Uh, we've also got uh, Fort McCoy in Wisconsin, Fort Bliss in Texas. They're for about 10 days. They're usually processed. They're checked. Uh, they do background checks. At this point, they're also vaccinated. Eventually, they get settled just like refugees would. So you'll see communities all across the country in states like even California, states like Maryland and Virginia. Today, we saw those governors say they would be taking these people in. They get resettled and eventually become uh, part of the fabric of, of everyday American lives, and, and they live uh, in normal communities like, like the rest of us would. Joe Khalil, thank you so much for your reporting. Among the fears of those living, or uh, rather leaving uh, Afghanistan, how Taliban rule will affect women in the country is of major concern. Women have come a long way over the past 20 years, and now there is a anxiety over how much of the progress could be reversed. Here's Farzana Kochai, a member of the Afghan parliament, speaking today. For sure, I'm afraid of myself, my life, and my, my freedom to work and my freedom to speak up. These are the things that I'm afraid, afraid of losing them. Joining us now, News Nation's Ashley Banfield, host of Banfield. Ashley, Afghanistan has come such a long way in terms of women's rights since 20 years ago. The Afghan constitution now allowing them to vote, millions have gone to school, but does this overthrow mean that all of those strides will be reversed? I feel like, Adrian, this is the $64,000 question for half the population. Here's the deal. If it's the Taliban from 20 years ago, you can expect a pretty ruthless life if you're a woman. You cannot leave the house unless you're covered in one of these. This is a burqa that I bought in Jalalabad in the market in Afghanistan. It's an authentic one. Um, if I put my hand under it, Adrian, take a look. That's as good as you can see. That's it. You are literally a ghost. The uh, pedestrian deaths among women who wear burqas far outweigh the men because you can't see and you can't be seen. And that's the whole point. Women have to stay inside. They can't leave unless they have a male escort who is related to them. They cannot go to school. That's the 20 years ago Taliban. There's lots of talk that they are a newer, fresher, sort of more diplomatic Taliban that wants world recognition. They were cowboys back then. Now they're more mature. Does that mean that they're going to do something anything to allow women more rights than they had when they ruled back in 2001. That's the thing that remains to be seen. But today, Adrian, they were going door to door and scrubbing all images of women outside of beauty parlors like those, you know, billboards outside uh, of, a, of a, um, a business to advertise. If it was a woman whose face was showing, they were either scraping it off or painting over it. So there's just just genuine terror among women as to what the future, you know, has in store for them. And I dare say Kabul, 
will be different than out in the hinterland because it's very tribal out there and no matter what the government or the Taliban says, a lot of those original very conservative rules will apply. Yeah, those villagers are going to live a, a strictly different life under the Taliban's form of Islam as compared to Kabul. And we heard from Farzana Kochai, but are we hearing from other women in Afghan parliament or other Afghani women who are responding to this takeover? And, and, and what are their major fears? So it's, you know, we're all of, what, 24 hours into this. So women who were um, in a position of power are terrified for their lives because that is absolutely verboten. So many of them don't know. They're not in negotiations with the Taliban. I witnessed a colleague of mine from CNN being told to step aside as she was trying to interview Talib men um, outside of the U.S. Embassy there. She was head to toe dressed in niqab, which is black covering. It wasn't the burqa, which is this. And I always want to tell people, not everything is a burqa. This is a burqa. When you see someone dressed like a blue ghost, it's a burqa. If you have hijab or head covering or niqab, that's different. And so there was Clarissa Ward dressed in head to toe, head to toe respectful Islamic garb being told to step aside as they spoke with her male crew members. So that's kind of just the law of the sidewalk right now. And if you're a member of parliament, you're probably gone. You probably shouldn't be there, male or female. And whether there will be female members of parliament, I am willing to bet everything I own that is not gonna happen. I just hope they can go to school past age seven. Mm. Yeah, I watched actually an interview earlier today at some members of the Taliban. It's eerie seeing them say, oh, you know, they'll be able to go to school. Oh, we're for peace and women have their rights. But we've seen that there is a distinct difference between the rights of women and the rights of men. But there have been humanitarian mm -hmm. groups and women's groups in Afghanistan. What are those groups and other nations who have had humanitarian responses there saying or doing at this time? So the Russians and the Chinese still have embassies open. <laughs> they're not rushing for the border. They're not rushing for the C-17s. They're still there. I don't suspect that the Russians or the Chinese give a hoot about what the Taliban is doing with its women. They've got their own issues with, uh, you know, human rights. But I can say this. The current situation will unfold fairly quickly. The Taliban is not wishy-washy. They make things known. And this is going to sound awful. And if you're watching right now, please don't shoot the messenger. But there is one good thing about the Taliban, and it's a great thing. They restore order where there is none. That country was at civil war for 26 years when I arrived in, gosh, it was uh, November of 2001. And it was absolute calamity when they got there, but they restored order. They did it in a brutal way and they subjugated 50% of the people to do so, but it was calm and it was safe. It was safe to be there. The women I talked to when I asked about wearing the burqa and being shrouded and being you know, housed inside, and by the way, I had to be inside as well. I had to stay with women when I was housing in Afghan households. I wasn't with the military. I wasn't one of, I was a unilateral, I wasn't an embed. Um, they said, you know, we feel safer with the burqa on because when we walk around outside, if we're allowed to be outside, nobody knows if we're a pretty young girl or an old lady. And that makes us feel safe. Wow. And that's just such an incredible statement to hear. And you know what, Adrian? It's just like November of 2001 right now. Well, that is terrifying on many levels. And it's obviously a different lens that they look through as opposed to how we are seeing the story play out on television. Ashley, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming on. You can catch more of Ashley tonight on Banfield, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central, here on News Nation. What kind of impact will Afghanistan's fall have on the war against terror? Not a good one, says former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. How bad will things get? That conversation, next. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh...
20 years of fighting, America's longest war, and the Taliban reclaim Afghanistan in just over a week. Was it preventable? Let's get perspective right now from Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He was National Security Advisor under President Trump, and he's author of Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. General, thank you so much for being with us tonight. First, you were one of the people who warned of pending disaster in the Wall Street Journal. The White House is saying it inherited this mess in Afghanistan from the Trump administration. What is your response? Well, Adrian, it's a failure across multiple administrations, I would say. And I think that when we saw the, 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 you know, the, the conditions set for this humanitarian catastrophe was when we began to negotiate with the Taliban and what I, led to a capitulation agreement uh, in, in 2019. And, and this is the idea that you can announce to your enemy the same, you could say the same during the Obama administration and the Trump administration, you know, they schedule for your departure, tell them you're leaving, and then negotiate with them. You're setting yourself to only make concession after concession, which is what happened. And I think this, this catastrophe that we're seeing was wholly predictable. Now, it's also reversible in terms of being able to address the humanitarian crisis there now. We're seeing some halting steps to do that. But I'll tell you, Adrian, what I would like to see is to, to see us take back control, not only of the airport, but of some, some safe corridors to get some of the people out uh, who worked with us and who stand to lose everything uh, under this brutal Taliban uh, dictatorship, theocratic dictatorship. We're watching the video of people running alongside and in front of that plane that has now gone so viral and the desperation of Afghanis who want to get out of the country. I mean, just, it's, it's inconceivable, really. And President Trump also wanted U.S. troops to leave Afghanistan. How did you advise him? How did you warn him against this happening? Well, you know, that was, that was President Trump's predilection, right, was to get out of Afghanistan. And my job as National Security Advisor was to give him multiple options. And so what we did is we began with that option. This is what it looks like if we pull out of Afghanistan stand precipitously. And this was all predictable. And that's when, when President Trump approved the South Asia strategy that he announced in a speech in August of 20, uh, 2017. And I'll tell you, Adrian, I think this was the first, really, the, I mean, the only time when we have had a reasoned and sustainable approach uh, in place for Afghanistan. And sadly, you know, the Trump administration abandoned that strategy, engaged in, in these futile you know, negotiations uh, with, uh, with this terrorist organization. And, and, then, and then the Biden administration doubled down on that flawed approach to the war. What's so sad about this, Adrian, is that we had a sustainable level of commitment there. I don't, who knows what the number would have been? You know, 8,500, 3,500, it doesn't really matter. What matters is we were enabling the Afghans to take the brunt of the fight and to prevent what you see happening today from happening and to allow Afghans to continue to enjoy the freedoms that they've enjoyed since we defeated the Taliban and threw them out of control out of government in Afghanistan in 2001. But the amount of money spent on, and the amount of resources given to train, and it seemed to all be upended in what seems like days. Were you surprised by how quickly this country dissolved? No, I wasn't, because, Adrian, we delivered psychological blows to the Afghan security forces and the Afghan government that went far beyond what the Taliban was capable of delivering physically. And that's by telling them that, you know, that we're leaving. That's by forcing the Afghan government to release 5,000 of some of the most heinous people on earth. And then what happens is the Taliban then gain psychological strength. As you saw, you know, they, in some places they negotiated surrender. And when they take over territory and they take over populations, they just say to the, to the people, hey, if, if, you're, if your son, you know, if, you're, if your husband, if your father serves in the Afghan security forces, we will kill all of you. And so it, it was a psychological collapse more than it was even a physical collapse. And the context that this story lives in, I mean, we have a lens that we look through as Americans that would prevent us from even understanding the complex situation in Afghanistan, let alone the Middle East. Uh, the Afghan president actually fleeing, there were reports of him with money and cars, and he just posted a message saying the Taliban essentially have won, and now they're responsible uh, for ruling there. So what is the chance that Afghanistan will not be a terrorist haven. 
It's it's about zero, Adrian. I mean, th these groups are completely intertwined, right? We we engaged in this in self delusion. The, the first that you're seeing now today uh, exposed is that the Taliban would share power. Okay, how's that working out? The second is maybe that well, maybe the Taliban will impose a more benign form of Sharia in areas they control. We're seeing them line people up and commit mass murder uh, in the town squares. We're seeing them uh, repress women again, you know, forcing these marriages, so-called marriages, as as a cover for for rape, you know, of 15-year-old girls. I mean, this is this is the this is the real Taliban, and then also the the delusion that there's a bold line, you know, between the Taliban and other terrorist organizations. They are completely intertwined with and in some ways dependent on Al-Qaeda and the Haqqani network. And these groups have been sponsored as well by the Pakistan's inner services intelligence. And so we simplified it to, you know, just, we're just only, you know, entering into this negotiation with the Taliban. And we actually deluded ourselves to the extent that we imagined the Taliban would be partners with us uh, in, in counterterrorism. It's, 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 it would be laughable if it wasn't so sad and if it didn't have such profound uh, humanitarian consequences that we're seeing today. Well, it really does make you just shake your head at the screen because you're thinking about the fact that there were so many predictions, so many people saying this is what's going to happen if we pull out. And you mentioned terrorism. Now here at home domestically, the terror alert has been raised once again. What is the likelihood that there will be increased terror threats here in the United States? How feasible is that considering what the Taliban is doing in Afghanistan? It's, it's almost a certainty. And we know from recent experience, from the, the mass murder attacks of 9-11, we should remember the most devastating terrorist attacks in history where nearly 3,000 innocents lost their lives. Tens of thousands more were, were wounded and sickened by, by, the, by the after effects of, of that attack. And we should also learn from the complete withdrawal from Iraq, right, in, in, in December 2011. That's when then Vice President Biden called up President Obama and said, thank you for allowing me to end this goddamn war. Now, think about how ill-informed that is, the idea that that wars end when one party disengages, as if then in, in al-Qaeda in Iraq and now today al-Qaeda in, in Afghanistan, uh, they look around and say, well, the Americans are gone. I guess we'll just stop. This is all misframed, Adrian, and we keep talking about our desire, you know, to end endless wars. But, but what if it's an endless jihad that these terrorists are waging against us? That means that we have to remain engaged against these enemies of all civilized people. I mean, Afghanistan, Adrian, is a modern day frontier between barbarism and civilization. And what we're seeing today are, are the enemies of, of all humanity gaining strength, mm -hmm. gaining power. And this is as much a victory for Al Qaeda as it is for the Taliban. Do you see another adversary stepping into the country, possibly China, Russia? I, I, I don't think so. I think what they'll do is just try to try to contain the problem there, you know. But but and because they have really, you know, no humanitarian uh, drive uh, to to their to their policies. But of course, we know that problems that 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 emanate, you know, from that part of the world become much more dangerous once they reach our shores and other shores. So what you're going to see next is a massive refugee crisis uh, that's going to affect countries in the region, in Central Asia, and then Pakistan uh, it will become even, even more destabilized. Pakistan is a particularly dangerous place because it's a country that has nuclear weapons. And it's also a place that gives really access to narcotics trafficking in a way that can enrich these jihadist terrorist groups and make them even more potent and more dangerous. There are over 20 U.S. designated terrorist organizations in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border area. And they already want to commit mass murder uh, against us and our, and our interests and our allies abroad. You said this is reversible. Can you quickly say what you would do to reverse the situation? Well, the humanitarian catastrophe is reversible. I mean, I, I can't imagine that anybody, I can't imagine anybody thought it was a good idea to give up control of airports. So what you need is you need safe zones so that you can help those who are fleeing these murders uh, of the Taliban. You need safe corridors, and then you need means of evacuation. We are not Ecuador, Adrian. Right. right? We have a military that, who can do that. We have forces that are trained specifically for that mission. 
for securing airfields, the areas around it, and then providing that kind of sa safe passage. Yeah, safe and, enough and that I, people aren't I, jumping if, onto planes and hiding in the wells of tires or wheels, I mean, and, and yeah. plummeting to their death. I, I apologize, yeah. we are out of time, but I so appreciate that you have come on here today with your expertise. Thank you again for being with us. Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor for President Donald Trump and author of Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. Thank you again. America's longest war coming to an end, but the threat remains as we've been discussing with you, as you just heard right there, as we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11, Afghanistan will once again be in the hands of the Taliban. Now that the Taliban has gained hold of Afghanistan, the Pentagon warns terrorist groups based in the country could gain power faster than expected. So what does this mean for us here in the U.S.? Joining us now, veteran and gold scar husband Joe Kent. He lost his wife, Shannon, a four-term Afghanistan veteran in the fight against ISIS, and Brett Eagleson, who lost his father at the World Trade Center Towers in 9-11. Joe, we want to first start with you, and thank you both for being with us, but do you think that there's any reason about potential threats to the U.S. We've heard from military officials. What are your thoughts about the threat here now that the Taliban is ruling in Afghanistan? The Taliban taking over the day after we left, whether it was after 2002 when bin Laden escaped into Pakistan, or it is tomorrow, as we're seeing right now, this, this conclusion is, has been inevitable. The Taliban was going to take back over. Our uh, desire to go over there and try to build a democracy and try to build these uh, armies out of Pashtun tribes and warring tribal factions, it's always been destined to fail. What we need to do right now is ensure that we have the ability to collect intelligence and then conduct strategic strikes. That's all we've ever needed from this region. Everything else has just been a payday for the military industrial complex, and it simply has not worked. We have been able to project force and power when necessary to do counterterrorism strikes into Pakistan. That's how we actually got bin Laden and into places like Yemen, where threats like Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula have emanated attacks, attempted attacks against the U.S. homeland since 9-11. So I think as long as our intelligence services are allowed to do their jobs with covert action and they haven't gotten too dependent on a conventional military footprint, which I fear they have, we should retain the ability to strike in a chaotic environment like like this. Yeah, Joe, you, of course, served. It's clear, even by the way you speak, that you served for two decades yourself in the Army. So thank you for your service. Brett, the Taliban will still have control of Afghanistan on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the day your father passed away. How does that make you feel? Well, uh, first of all, I just want to thank the, my co-guest for his service. Um, and, uh, you know, right after 9-11, my brother joined the military as well. And he became an Army Ranger and did two tours of duty in Iraq. And um, I think what's absent from this conversation is the fact that we've sent thousands of service members off to places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Saudi Arabia is entirely missed from this category. And um, the fact that the Taliban is now back in control 20 years later, we have two countries really that have never been held accountable for 9-11. We ousted the Taliban 20 years ago, but here we are back at square one. And the Saudi government involvement still continues to be protected and under state secrets by the United States government. So it, it's, it's a sad day for all of our service members. It's a sad day for uh, the United States of America, really, is because our government refuses to come clean about what led to the events of 9-11. And if you look at it, it was the Taliban harboring all the all the Al Qaeda terrorists. That's where bin Laden trained his troops. And it was Saudi Arabia that provided the logistical and um, financial support network here in the United States prior to 9-11. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I know that you are awaiting the Biden administration's answer about the documents releasing those crucial 9-11 documents, something you've been fighting for for years that actually would tie Saudi Arabian government to the attacks. But how do you think it will change the impact of the war on terror and what's happening right now? Because it holds people accountable. It holds sovereign nations accountable. The Saudis can no longer get away with turning a blind eye to the bad elements within their uh, government. Same thing with the Taliban. If it's found that the Taliban is, is sponsoring and, and supporting radical jihadism, then the United States should have recourse against them. And our government needs to be open and honest about who funds and sources this radical jihadism. 
Joe, I have to turn it over to you. We only have a couple of minutes, but I want to talk to you about the fact that while we're seeing these dire images on screen and we're seeing the collapse of a whole nation, there are a lot of families celebrating right now. Their soldier family members are coming back home. What would you have to say to all those families who are actually thankful that they get to see their loved one again? Say thank you for your service. I'm glad that their loved ones are returned to them. We need to get all of our soldiers out of harm's way in these places where we have no actual national security interest. Afghanistan, Iraq, and to a certain extent, Syria have been a failure of the establishment. They sold us a false bill of goods. We took our eye off the actual target. That was Al Qaeda. My co-guest is absolutely right. We need to hold these governments like Saudi Arabia accountable. We need to hold the Pakistanis accountable. It's a big reason why I'm running for Congress right now is to hold the failed establishment accountable. We don't need to fight these forever wars. The guest that was on previous, H.R. McMasters, he has been part of the establishment that's been selling these lies that we have to go and prop up the Afghan military, the Iraqi military, when really we could save ourselves the blood and the treasure and just use diplomacy and limited counterterrorism strategy to achieve our national security objectives. So that's what we need to demand from our elected officials. It's a big reason why I'm in the race right now. I want to get into Congress, get on the Armed Services Committee, and hold these generals and the military industrial complex accountable. All right. I'm going to just, I'm, I'm going to probably just guess that your answer to this question would be yes, into wishing we had withdrawn earlier. Joe, I only have time for you to answer with a one word response. Yes. 100%. And Brett, same, same with you. I say hold the Saudis accountable. All right. Thank you to you both. We really appreciate Amen. it. Gold Star husband Joe Kent and 9-11 families advocate Brett Eagleson. Afghanistan has fallen to the Taliban. We've been saying it all hour, and we have so many stories that are coming out of Afghanistan and D.C. President Biden says he does not regret his decision, how 13 hours changed the shape of this nation. I stand squarely behind my decision. After 20 years, I've learned the hard way that there was never a good time to withdraw U.S. forces. The sun rises in Kabul a couple of hours from now. Before we leave you tonight, a look at a chaotic 13 hours as reported by Axios. It started at 1.56 a.m. Eastern Sunday morning. Helicopters landing near the U.S. Embassy in Kabul as the Taliban advanced. An hour later, the Taliban held all Afghan border crossings, leaving Kabul airport as the only way out. 3.40 a.m. Eastern, Taliban militants entered the outskirts of Kabul. 6.09 Eastern, Afghan troops surrendered Bagram Air Base. Nearly four hours later, the president left the country. Two hours after that, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan was evacuated from the embassy. Three hours later, 2.43 p.m. Eastern, Al Jazeera airs video of Taliban fighters in the presidential palace. 20 years of work gone in 13 hours. Here's Leland Vittert with more On Balance.